This summer past, we journeyed to Prague, Czechoslovakia, to attend the International Transpersonal Conference, a meeting of philosophers, psychologists, anthropologists, writers, ecologists, and thinkers on global subjects. Throughout the conference, we were able to track down and interview some of the movers and shakers whose ideas and hopes will shape the new millennium. Prague was a fitting venue for this meeting, poised as it is at the center of European crisis and promise. It is a metaphor for the transformation of the planet and of human psychology that must take place if we are to provide a sane future for our children. I'm standing in the center of one of Central Europe's most beautiful and mysterious cities. This is Prague, Czechoslovakia, and I'm Terence McKenna. We're here to meet with some of the world's most outstanding thinkers to discuss science, spirituality, and the mounting global crisis. And it's fitting that we should meet in this, the capital of ancient Bohemia, for Prague and Bohemia have always stood for intellectual innovation, chance-taking, and the life of ideas. In the Jugendstil splendor of one of Prague's most famous concert halls, we encountered Richard Alpert and persuaded him to have lunch with us. Alpert, who now calls himself Ram Das, is one of the most enduring figures from the American cultural upheaval of the 1960s. Alpert, whose career reaches from Harvard University to the plains of the Punjab, has transformed himself into a spokesman for humanities ignored and downtrodden. And Ralph Abraham was sitting across the table watching me this have this thing. conversation. Yeah. And when Dr. It. Steiger left, Ralph leaned over to me and he said, so you see, Terence, the mushroom is telling you that it can reach out and touch you anywhere. And I thought that was yeah. amazing. Yeah. Well, any time you would like to or feel that you have the time to guide me through anything at all, I'd be happy to be your... Oh, okay. Oh, and uh, excuse me, sir, you, you are not the famous uh, Terence Mushroom McKenna, that is you, my, uh, my friend, I, 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 it I, I is. am aware of. That's him. It That's is. Oh, how wonderful. It is. Yes, sir. Please do welcome uh, you on our Bohemian Highway here. I especially bring you a very good uh, black uh, coffee and uh, espresso. And, uh, if you may tell me, who is the attractive elderly gentleman you brought on your side, on your companionship here? This is Mr. Dawes. Oh, uh, the MS Dawes, yes. No, the oh. Ram Das. Oh, the, the CD Ram. The CD Ram, yes. Oh, the, 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 the LSD, the LSD, LSD Das. The LSD Das, yes, the one, oh, yes. Oh, wonderful. Take this, uh, Bill the Bee. Oh, thank you. you. Thank Very you. Very Bohemian. And uh, <laughs> so, uh, this... Uh, I am so happy to be in your fair country. Oh, my country, very fair, and uh, happy to have the LSD experience. You know, you what is your name? Cubes. What is your name? Uh, my name is Waiter. Waiter, waiter. Yes. how do you do, Waiter? waiter. Yeah. A pleasure. Yeah. See you, Waiter. Okay. <laughs> See you, Waiter. <laughs> you don't think there's any... It would, it would need the external form of the mushroom. It would never have happened for me. I only argue from my own experience. Yeah, but you and I were both so thick in crap when it had... You know, that's why we needed it. Well, but there are a few others out there. We didn't corner the market on yeah. being thick and crap. Yeah, but I'm talking about somebody like a Ramana Maharshi or somebody like that. Oh, well, these you people. Know, I mean, there are people. Sure, who, but the idea is not to come up with something that the best among us can make hay with, but a, a democratic, uh, something which addresses the species. The thing that seemed to me so important about the psychedelic experience was that it happened to me. I wasn't reading John Chrysostom or Meister Eckhart. Exactly. Of course those guys... Right on. It happened to me. It happened to me, yes. 
And, and so yeah. I assume that I am a very ordinary person. Therefore, if it happened to me, it could happen to anyone. And that's, that's really That's a questionable. You know, there's a set of assumptions there. One, that you're a very ordinary person. And whether the same chemical given to a dozen people would bring about 11 other people like this. And I think experience. it would be not, it, it would, the outcome would be very different. And that's, it, I keep getting cast into an evolution of consciousness model about individuals. Because there's such marked individual differences as to three people come before my guru, one completely goes, and the other two get a chapati. And people take psilocybin, and they some go like that, and they go like that, and some go like that, and they go like that. Well, don't you think a good metaphor for it would be sexuality? Apparently, there are some people who can kind of take it or leave it, and others of us, uh, it rears its ugly head with great uh, presence. Yet everybody has to I come notice to as I get older, I move from one of these categories to the other. <laughs> it leaves so much space in my life. I don't know what to do with my free time. I hope it never happens to me. Uh. <laughs> just clinging. <laughs> just clinging. No, just aspiring to cling. <laughs> Actually, I live the life of an ascetic. It's my aspirations that are pulling me down. Uh. Well, see, the great, the nice thing about this evolutionary argument is that you can sort of make the snake take its tail in its mouth exactly. because exactly. it does. The escape is not into some science fiction future. No, it's into an archaic recursion of some sort. We we once knew everything we need to know. Yeah. So what we are trying to find out is lost knowledge, not new knowledge and if you direct people back toward 10,000 20,000 years ago they see a kind of completion that an open-ended future is uh, it seems to me it's a con it's a confusing thing to use time in that way because it makes the artifacts of that period seem to be valued as opposed to the artifacts of this period it seems to me that I, I mean whether you, you call it not science fiction but science fiction can also be very compassionate it can be very historically relevant it doesn't have to be uh, it's just using a different set of artifacts to work with so well for instance I see most of what's happened in the 20th century as being unconsciously driven by this fascination with the archaic fascination with the archaic yes I mean wow that was uh, of all the things I predicted you'd say it wasn't that tell me what well uh, for instance uh, impressionism deconstructs the hard image of realism and gives you a feeling toned thing which mm -hmm. was very antithetical to Victorian Edwardian thought then Freud and Jung describe different aspects of the unconscious but to do it Jung ha uh, Freud has to talk about uh, repressed primitive sexual imaginings Jung talks about folklore fairy tales and mythology meanwhile the Dadas and the surrealists are saying we have to break up the linear expectations of the bourgeois mind and then you get at Jackson Pollock and mm -hmm. those people who say the image itself has to be thrown out and then to my mind the psychedelic thing in the 60s based on rock and roll and a boundary dissolving psychedelic we almost by a random walk are finding our way toward shamanism tribalism nomadism uh, go beyond the isms to find out tell me what we're really finding we're finding a world made out of mind rather than stuff great okay we're finding a world made out of mind every time you describe which mind you find that's just limiting a limiting condition. I mean, if we just find the, the thing of mind-created stuff, live in that, then what happens? Well, I mean, there is a transcendental dimension beyond language. It's just hard as hell to talk about it. But if you live in it and talk from there, then the forms that it will manifest in become just the forms it manifests in. 
it's nothing more or less than that. So, so you mean you download the unspeakable you down, you, into language and yeah, let the chips it, fall where they may? Well, they don't fall where they may. They fall in a perfectly harmonious pattern. Well, that's them falling where they may. Where they may, where yeah. they will. Yeah. 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 Well, so what I'm hearing from you is you have a very strong sense of the pattern, strong enough that your limited, necessarily limited personal viewpoint doesn't tend to get in the way. You can always push the reset to hope button, and then you hope almost on principle. Trump has said to me, stand halfway between hope and hopelessness. I thought that was very useful. And is that... Eh? No. <laughs> what is it's, it? Ah! It's ah. It's, <laughs> it's the ecstasy <laughs> of total horror and total beauty at the same moment. That's what I feel again and again. It's when I'm with somebody dying of AIDS. My God, my, my heart's breaking. It's horrible. I mean, it's a ghastly the, the social ostracization, this, that, opportunistic illness and everything. And there's another part of me that's giggling. And I can hardly handle the, the, the multifrenia of it all, in the sense of the, the perfection of it all, and the beauty of the moment, and the horrible shit of it. You know? Well, it all is spun together. Is that because you feel confident that the self is somehow indestructible, or because you don't even ask that question? You got to watch the words indestructible because that has a time dimension. I mean, I think the that awareness is uh, that. Uh, but for example, I, do you think this is the stage upon which all acts are performed, or that we move no, up and one down the many it's, levels? Oh, infinite number of probably infinite number because I just look into two minds and I see two different ones. And those are all on just this one. No, I feel like... Like I have this friend Emmanuel, you know, this spook that has no body. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, Emmanuel's two lines to me were, death is absolutely safe, first thing. That's a very profound statement. And the next thing he said, it was like taking out the tight shoe. And then I said to him, Emmanuel, what am I doing here? Who made this error? What am I doing on this plane? He said, you're in school, why don't you try taking the curriculum? And the curriculum is? Life. Any life? It means, it means the exploration of the clinging of mind within the world of projected form. So the exploring life. It's the exploring life with the, pur it's purposive in the sense of returning back into the Garden of Eden. It's a return. There is a return metaphor underlying all of it. And I'm sure you're asked this all the time, so am I. Uh, maybe we give different answers. Do you think that this can be done without psychedelics fast enough to have an impact on the global situation? Uh, I could conceive that it could be. Uh, you, you asked, do I think? I don't really have an opinion whether it will or won't, but I, I could see it go either way. Well, I mean, I could, like John Seed said to me, it's too late as far as the rainforest is concerned. He says the inertia is too great in the whole system. It's too late. So I said, okay, John. I mean, it was the first time somebody said it to me just like that. He said, it would take a miracle. I said, oh. That threw me back on whatever that was. And then he said, but after all, he said, we came up out of the ocean, came onto land. He said, we have quite a lineage of miracles. I wouldn't underestimate us. That was a nice one. Well, so my question to you is, are psychedelics a miracle? Psychedelics are a miracle, yes. They may not be the only miracle. Are they the they, miracle we need? I don't know that. I don't know that. I think they may have already done what they were to do. Really? That's yeah. interesting. I've I think it's never heard anybody I think say what that. is done is so much more powerful than anybody yet recognizes. 
See, I see that the, all this destruction is just the process of transformation. The question is whether we keep it together in the process of transformation. And that's why all I'm interested in doing is becoming a person and helping others become a person who in the process of the dramatic stuff will keep some equanimity and keep there's some love and some presence in that process. But that's psychedelics may play a role in that. Mm -hmm. So you're right, that comes back to your question. Your well, see, my assumption in trying to think about thousands of psychedelic trips rather than just mine, what they seem to do generically is they seem to dissolve boundaries. Yes. And the ego yes. is in the business of creating, maintaining, and defending boundaries. So I really see the psychedelics as directly intervening in the core process which is running us over the edge, which is our inability to emotionally connect with the consequences of what we're doing. If for a single yeah. moment we could yeah. feel what we're doing, yeah. we would stop. I understand. But we do it's not. It's interesting because you take images that all, all of us know um, of the um, a girl running down the street naked in, uh, in uh, Cambodia, mm -hmm. you know, or something like that. And we say that wasn't strong enough. It all, you know, it won the Life of the Year award, but it wasn't strong enough. It didn't stop everybody and say, holy shit, what are we doing here? You know? So what would be strong enough to do that? And you say, well, psychedelics, but that's in a, it's in a one-on-one -on -one thing. I mean, we're talking major game players at this moment. Mm -hmm. Take, I mean, put China into your computer. You know? How do you deal with you that? Know, I mean, either you're spraying it or it's water or it's, it's some other level of consciousness that does it. There is a a certain level of trauma that's possible that can soften the ground. Right? Not Three Mile Island and not Chernobyl, but I mean, I'm, <laughs> I don't want to create this with my mind, but I can imagine a certain trauma like in Marin, when they ran out of water. Mm -hmm. It was interesting. Suddenly, all the ego barriers and everything, and neighbors were talking who'd never even met each other. People were taking and a showers whole together. Yeah, exactly. A whole right. process was happening. I'm sure marriages, babies were conceived, everything, as a result of that trauma, of that denial. So a, a massive, significant trauma. I just got to tell you one scary image. There's a saint in India who lived up to about uh, 1930, I think, or something. And one of his devotees said to me, one night he was sort of looking off in the distance, and he said, there'll come a time, he said, when you'll walk five miles, and he said, you'll sight the light from a fire of another person, and you'll be so happy to know another person exists. Quite a prediction. Isn't that quite a prediction? Yeah. It's in there. It's just in there somewhere. You know? Interesting. Yes, well, I, I agree. I think that, that what's going to happen is that... Gentlemen, everything is fine with the evolution of coffee and consciousness. <laughs> Both get very good with you, too. You have yes. come just at the right time. Yes, this is I just yes. what I want. How did you know? You me. tuned into a higher level. A higher level. A higher level. level high, very high, yes. I eat Bohemian mushroom soup today. You know? Ah. Are you at the heat we were just talking about that. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. You, you, you like Bohemian mushroom soup? I like Let mushroom. Let me sprinkle liberally some water on your chalice, sir. Oh, please. That is, uh, liberally sprinkle one. his chalice, yes. for sure. Very good. I am and, a uh, chalice, so it's fine if you wish to. Oh, I know you be you, you by your true name. You're Mr. Yes. Chalice, sir. Yes. yes. Very good. You also some please. water in your... No, no, in, in, no. I, I was confused. <laughs> Let me put this here and uh, have fun with the uh, shaman strudel. Bohemian, very good. Thank you very much. Nicole, when things are getting dangerous. I'll okay. call you. I'll be right back. Not to worry. Good, good. <laughs> <clears throat> can I ask you a personal question? You can ask me anything you'd it's like, Terence. It's not a personal question to you. It's a personal question from me. How, how do you like having the projection? special identity constantly laid on it's a sadhana it's my practice that's a good answer although you didn't say how you liked it I like it to the capacity I have to transpose it 
if I can't, I mean, sometimes these are going very fast, and to just keep it transposed, then it, I love it. I love it. It's like a fire. If the minute I start to lose it, it's a fucking drag. It really is. Because, I mean, you know, I was in a system, situation in Miami where all these women with blue eyes and coiffured hair were grabbing at the buttons of my jacket. And I thought, oh, I don't want this. Whatever this life is, I don't want to be part of this. I mean, this is, they eat your flesh, finally. Sure. And, but I realized at any time, I can walk away from it. And it's my, you know, I'm, I'm a free agent. So do you never get in a situation where you say, gee, I'd like to do X, but Ram Dass would never do that? My uh, stock and trade, or my coinage, is in sharing just those predicaments publicly. See, I've turned it into, right? You've managed to, but public confession is the subtlest form of wastrelry. Of wastrelry, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I do it myself. <laughs> Say, I'm not a good guy, don't follow me, I'm a bad guy. Then I leave the stage and say, now I can really be a bad guy. <laughs> Come up and see my holy pictures. <laughs> That's the one of my lines in my lecture. <laughs> I don't. I'll tell you. You're all. I only see the uh, the stuff that would disturb me is inside myself. It has nothing to do with out there. I out there is just being what it is, and I'm responding with my own stuff. And if my stuff is my enemy, it's going to get too much for me. And if it isn't, you know. Depends on how much I can consume it, joyfully participate in it, passionately, all of it. Well, you've sort of achieved a unique synthesis. I mean, you're almost a secular holy man, because I don't think people, I don't care much about what you believe or who you light candles to. Basically, I think I heard you describe yourself once as a kind man. And you've gotten incredible mm -hmm. mileage out of that because there are so few. It's far out. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is... Well, when you talked about coming back into the boundarylessness, to me, that's the whole quality of compassion, has that boundarylessness to it. It's that your suffering is my suffering, and your joy is my suffering, and you are me, and here we are. And if and you, you hurt, feel I'm it. responding to your hurt, not because I'm a good guy and you're needful, just because here is... This is suffering, and this is the response to suffering, and we're both part of the same thing. And that's the way I like to play it from. That's, to me, it's like riding a wave. It's the joy of just being part of the force of compassion in the universe. Well, when, when you look, you mentioned in your talk the other night, since some people think the 90s are going to be a second turn of the spiral, I observed the 60s as a spear-carrying 14-year-old. I was down in the masses. What were the mistakes that are avoidable than if there's a second chance? They're inevitably going to be avoided. The first mistake was idealism. The first mistake, and the mistake was thinking that because you had seen it, you could just go like that and everybody else would see it. And you could just say, it's all love, and then everybody would love. I mean, that was, it was a naivete. It was naivete. It was not working on ourselves deeply enough to be without the clinging of mind that made us try to use it. It's, it, was, it was our lurking righteousness that got in our way. Can you make a revolution, though, without an inner righteousness? That's exactly, that's the far out question of where would the action come from? And there's this line in Buddhism that says, out of emptiness arises compassion. And what I experience is that there is a way in which I can sit down in front of a truck or feed a person or go make love or go surf. And there is an appropriateness in every one of those acts. And for me to hear that, I've really got to shut up. And my, uh, my work is to keep shutting up, to hear which one it is. And if it is a revolution, it's a rev so be it. Mm -hmm. So be it. You know the story of the, of the monk and the uh, army general, you know, and the army general's disemboweling all the monks? Tell and me. his reputation has spread far and wide. He's <laughs> a cruel, cruel man. 
and he comes into this village and he says to his adjutant, tell me what's happening. And the adjutant said, all the people are frightened, they're bowing down to you. All the monks in the monastery have fled to the hills but one monk. And the general was outraged about this one monk. And he gets up and he goes to the monastery and he pushes open the doors of the monastery and he walks into the courtyard and there's the monk standing in the middle of the courtyard. And he walks up to him and he says, don't you know who I am? I could take my sword and run it through your belly without blinking an eye. And don't you know who I am? I could have your sword run through my belly without blinking an eye. That's great. That's the place from which revolutions can, can heal, rather than just starting the cycle all over again. Then this is the place we never found in the 60s. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've always said no. we, it was no. all we well We reduced and good. it to revolution, rather, and although we had the taste of evolution, we reduced it to revolution. Well, in the day they came with machine guns, we didn't stand like that monk. Everybody said, well, my God, you could get killed playing this game. And I flew to Laos and India for three years. But already we had produced the bay by being so busy being we. Because so that they even noticed we, the fact that they noticed us was because we were busy being, we were busy making statements instead of just being it. So maybe, I mean, this is just occurring to me, that being in a place like Prague, the real thing we have to learn here is how to make velvet revolutions, non-confrontation. Exactly. exactly right, exactly right. That's why I admire Havel so much. That's why he's way up there in my... Because he's, 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 he's a compassionate leader. He's got wisdom, not just knowledge. He is tuned. There's a, there's a quality of his heart that feels present. And he said in this op-ed article, I just read his letter last month. Uh, I've read it too. And you know, he, at one point he said, uh, he said, we have to allow the naturalness to come back, the personal stuff, the heart stuff. I mean, he was right there with all of the... Do you see, I mean, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I don't, let me preface it by saying, do you see anybody who could play that role for the millions of kids in England and the United States who are now asking, where do we go from here? that good or bad? I guess the situation hasn't demanded the emergence of that being it. Of those kinds of... Because it can't be anybody that comes forward and says, I'm it. Oh, no. It has you to know. be someone who... The but the situation you're can it. demand the formation. I mean, you, you watch, does, does, the, does the man make the time or does the time make the man? You know, and you can feel how what took a certain person 20 years like to ride a bicycle, somebody later on can ride a bicycle like that because the whole culture rides bicycles. There's some like uh, process where it, the situation emerges where the person has to come forward and they're just forced out. I mean, I go and I look at all the senators that are running for this or that and I go to breakfast with them and I listen and I tune and Jerry Brown I hung out with and I said, you know, he's got interesting ideas, but as a, his heart, my God, he's got work to do. This poor guy, he's suffering so much. And, and I just keep, I love him, and I want those ideas out, but I want him to work on himself, you know? And uh, so but I don't do see you really out. care in terms of political terms whether Jerry Brown makes himself palatable to an electorate? I care because I work with the Mayan widows in Guatemala, and I feel like I'm representing them, and our, our government, our administration's policies are killing them and their children and their husbands and some way I've got to play my part as a member of a society that is imposing so much suffering on so many people. I can't just walk away and say, oh, I'm helping the nice Mayans. I've also got to realize I'm an American citizen that's hurting the Mayans and I've got to play both games to change one one way and to do the other thing. So <clears throat> there's a kind of, um, not to go egghead here, but a kind of coincidencia positorum, because on one level what you're saying is, it's all right, don't worry. And on another level, you clearly are involved in a search for defining your role, your where you would do some good. Optimum judo move. Optimum judo, judo move. move. So it isn't Awaken enough to just say... System. 
the system will take care of itself. But I am part of the system that is taking care of itself. So, so it's a sense I'm of acting without it. acting through self. It's being not identified with the actor and not being identified with the fruits of the action. That's, I mean, to me, the, my, one of my basic texts is the Bhagavad Gita, and those are the two injunctions. Mm -hmm. And I really hear those. And they're very weird. How you do an act when you're not identified with being the actor and you're not attached to fruits. I mean, I, I lead this, this funny, continuous paradox that suffering stinks and suffering's grace. And I live with both of those all the time. Well, I don't. I think most people do. Don't you I think? think most people have made a taken a position. Oh, that suffering is bad. They hate it. They want oh, to keep it away from. Or that it's grace and it's, you know, lovely. Well, and then the great masses of people never really draw the distinction because no. for them, suffering is like air and water. It's life. It, it's life. It comes with it's it. Life. Yeah. Burying yeah. the many children you bear. That's why I found in the villages in India less suffering than I found around the middle class in America. Certainly less whining. Well, less preoccupation with their with what they don't have. Well, they have a philosophy of reincarnation that must sustain them. There is something else that's feeding them. Where we have a philosophy of, you know, if you don't get it now, no, you never, never will. <clears throat> exactly. We threw out in the councils of Nicaea, Trent, and Constantinople just the thing that would have healed, but we did it so that the church could have power over it. Well, I think it was Friedrich Nietzsche who said there was only one Christian and they crucified him. <laughs> yes, <exactly. laughs> oh, God, that's so good. That's such a good line. <laughs> Here comes... <laughs> now, have you been uh, waiting for me? Because I'm the waiter, I need to wait. We've been looking everywhere for you, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. I've been waiting for the here and now, but that was somewhere else. Well, but can I uh, help you here a bit, sir? Uh, you can help us here, and you can help us now. There. Oh, very yes. good. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll help you here. I hope you enjoy my conversation. Yeah. No, I mean... Fine. Do we get a check, or is, is this all on the house? No, no, I am the check. I am the check. <laughs> this is Prague, my sir. God is everywhere, but Czechland is here, you know? <laughs> Okay. I keep one more bottle for you, you in the yes, refrigerator. You know. Hold it and but not in the here and now. In the somewhere else, maybe later. But see you. Well, my, you know, I was asking you what did we do wrong in the '60s. Yeah, okay. One thing that I has occurred to me, and I certainly felt it with my friends, was we assumed it would go on forever. We had no notion of window of opportunity. Yes. We just thought we'd yeah. blown the doors off yeah. the, the hinges and they would yeah. never be put back on. Yeah. To me, the most amazing transformation in my lifetime is not the revolution of the 60s, but the counter-revolution of the 70s, where they managed to put the cuckoo clock back together again, even though we'd kicked it Did all they over or the... didn't they? That's what I'm... Uh, see, you keep thinking there was that opportunity in a close, and I think it happened then. And all of the 70s and 80s, and all that was this kind of reverberation to this process. And that I'm here, and you're here, and we're both still here since the 90s, and I got a lot of people that... Uh, you know, I talk now in middle America, and I look at my audiences, and they—they've never taken dope, they've never—they've never read holy Eastern holy books or anything. And I just say the same stuff I was saying in the '60s that I was saying to people with flowers and big pupils. And these people in the middle—you know—they're corseted, nice people, and they're going. And I think, far out, look, it happened. And I was looking the other way. Well, that's true. And that's where you're looking for the resonance of a person to come forth that speaks from that consciousness with the assurance of the truth of it. Right. You know? That's what I think. Why uh, all this business of a Christ figure. I mean, I see why how seductive it is, but how we, we're, we've gotten very cynical because we've projected into such a person a purpose. Instead of just that light forming out of the needs of the moment to create that light to which... Because I find if I speak from a true enough for a moment when I can do it, from a true enough place in my heart, it 
it reduces the paranoia, the subtle veils of paranoia in another person. They, they don't, I don't do it to them, it just falls away. Because they test, they're testing. And they don't get from me anything that says like that. And I just watch them like a flower. They uh -huh, like that. Uh -huh. And that, and I think, boy, I give a lot to just be that instrument. You know, that's worth working Well, that's for. a great role. That's worth, it's, but this is all for everyone else. That's the role for, that's the role. That's what I said to the ITA. I said, you know, just don't talk about it. Exactly. Let's, let's do it. it. Let's be it. Do for it. That's it. Well, you know, Blake said a wonderful thing. He said, if I can get it right, if the truth can be told so as to be understood, it will be believed. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So all you have to do exactly. is say it. Exactly. When can you say it simply enough? Is it only said in silence simply enough? Or are there words? Or is there music? Or is there what? Or is there... There's words, there's music, there's silence, there's gesture. Because yeah. it, it's always going to exceed one's grasp. See, my mantra is the Gandhi line, my life is my message. That, yes, you said that the other night. Level That's very of good. Of every level of being. I think I'm at a little lower level because I'm very aware that um, I have to struggle to have my to say my life is my message. I would almost rather say my message is my message. Please don't look at my life because I'm a fallible human being and I'm constantly but fucking up. But you see up. how that weakens your message. You see how that quality has means that the message doesn't come from the the root, the central, it, you're, it, there's a way in which it waffles. True. Because, and that's the thing, I, I really can't, once I saw the possibility of that, I said, why waffle? What is worth holding on to that's worth waffling about? Well, I once said to Leo Zeff, I'm sure you knew Leo, I said to him in a, oh, in a meeting, meeting. Uh, I said, Leo, you're, you're finished, you're completed, you're, you're baked. Me, I'm half-baked. <laughs> and I hope that the rest of my life will finish the baking but you don't, process. you're not half-baked. That's what's interesting. I mean, when you and I talk, you and I hear each other perfectly. Truth. And so where are we hearing each other from? I mean, then we each play our game the way we play our game. You know, and you can play your game saying I'm half-baked. That's your strategy if you choose. <laughs> it's a mercurial strategy. <laughs> yes, I understand. <laughs> Here's to Mercurius. Hmm. You have somehow been able to survive the gauntlet of American media in a way that your colleagues and comrade in arms didn't seem to. They either had to step away from their leader role or they transmuted it into some lesser thing. So now Allen Ginsberg is poet laureate. Tim Leary is, uh, you know, keeps the club scene in Los Socrates Angeles is interesting. Yes. yes, but you, in a sense, never backed down, never retooled. You were also not first among equals back in the original thing. But when all is said and done, I was always the second. In a way, it's like birds. If you stay just behind the lead bird, you don't have to do much, you know? You're just kind of riding along on the... On the well, and Ralph yeah. tells me to be third is the real good <laughs> position. <laughs> it's like being the young prince. You won't ever be king. It was, actually, it was only until about five years ago. That I'd, in the past five years, they've stopped introducing me as Tim Leary's partner. Right. Know? And which, I mean, I think that was great. I see him as one of my, you know, first teachers, great teacher. Uh -huh. And, uh, but I don't have the fun for me. Aaron says, I have no model of myself. I mean, I don't know who I am. I don't know whether I'm an anachronism from the 60s or I'm a just about to happen. A prophet to be. Yes, I have no idea. And I don't care. That's what I saw. Because either of them, all the things you get in either way are a drag and they're beautiful, equally. 
No, well, I think you're a prophet to be. I think we all are. The, you I think know, we all are. Yes. As Bilbo Baggins once said, the greatest adventure still lies ahead. I believe that. Yeah, I'll believe I that too. when they lower my box. I I'll do believe too. That. I do too. Exactly. Good. Exactly. Well, thanks yeah. for coming by. I'm sure you had many, many demands on you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Pleasure. Good. I was afraid of you up until now. Now I'm delighted to no, be no, with you. No, no, don't be afraid of me. The people who are afraid of me don't know me, or no. they know me better than I you know. ever will. <laughs> <laughs> Angela Sarian is an anthropologist and workshop leader from California who brings the unique perspective of her Basque ancestors to the formulation of a new discipline which I would call neo-shamanic anthropology. So there you have it, as the king said to Mozart. Yes. Yes, as the caterpillar on top of the mushroom said, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> Well, so I looked over your newsletter, ah. um, and it looks like sort of a neo-shamanism is the mm -hmm. category that you are now defining in your public talks, is that right? Yeah, I'm doing a lot of that, but mostly um, universals, what we all have in common, finding those basic roots which then take us back to indigenous cultures. Archetypes? Archetypes. Uh-huh. Especially the archetype of the warrior and the healer and the teacher and the visionary. Those are the four that the shamanic or indigenous cultures really focus upon. Well, so you're genuinely in the mainstream of the archaic revival. I this... never thought about it that way, Terrence. <laughs> Well, actually, I'm sort of subliminally plugging my one of my books, ah. which is called The Archaic Revival. Ah. But the notion is that ah. what this whole cultural thrust of the 20th century, and especially the last 30 years, will ultimately be understood to be about, is a return to aboriginal yes. models. Yes. And that means especially shamanism, and to my mind, especially psychedelic shamanism. Yes, yes. Oh. So, but... You know, you can. The Renaissance went through a rebirth of classicism, yes. probably yes. without ever really articulating that yes. that's what was happening. Yeah, but true. I think this shamanic or Aboriginal ecological feminine partnership yes. impulse is yes. now pretty explicit. Too. So that's what I meant. Yeah. Well, I, I think that um, I love the title like archaic revival because at the same time what's coming up is everyone talking about a new world order right. and yet mm -hmm. in order to understand what constitutes a new world order we need to take a look at what the current world order is and so we really have essentially four worlds we have the um, industrialized first world and we have the the socialist bloc which will be the second world, and we have the third world countries, which are really the developing countries like Brazil, but the fourth world is really the aboriginal indigenous cultures um, that, that are within cultures but don't have the same kind of rights. And the first three worlds say that um, the land belongs to the people. But the fourth world say, says that the people belong to the land. And so that people belonging to the land is really an archetype. It's your archaic revival, but it's um, getting back to nature and owning those roots brings up that revival, which is the shift that we're going to need to make in order to do the new world uh, order is to get the people back to the land. Well, it's too bad that there's no place in the world where that aboriginal position is in a governing position. Uh, starting for the first time in the last three years is the establishment of the World Indigenous Council. And this summer in July is the first time that there will actually be a vote 
to have a seat on the United Nations where there will be representatives from each of the world indigenous peoples. And so that's, I'm real hopeful Really? About that. You mean every Amazonian tribe could potentially have a yes. delegate in yes. the UN? Yes. Or that they themselves could could have a council and vote who would be their best representatives uh -huh. as a bioregional group. Well, you know, it always, the there's some phrase in Latin, I can't remember what it is, but it means that he who does not expand his borders will have his land taken by yes. somebody else. Yeah. And this was the theory that drove colonization in South America. All, all of these countries like Peru, Colombia, Ecuador, uh, Venezuela, actually encroach on a vast aboriginal core in, yeah. of that continent, which should be self-governing. Yeah. And were it self-governing, it would be a tremendous... Huge force. Huge force. Yeah. It's amazing that I, I really think that for the last 20 years there's been this whole east-west bridging, but we're really starting in the last uh, five years to this north-south kind of bridging, and I, I really feel that um, that the Latin American countries, which there are are 12, plus the indigenous force countries, that the, the northern force would be Europe, Russia, um, Canada, but the, the whole southern force is like Africa, Asia, and the Latin American countries. And so that whole force, and those two forces really um, coming So together. even though you're a spiritual teacher, you talk global politics I like do. a State Department I second string. Do. I do. <laughs> well, I was thinking about the, the grandparents of the planet being the old Asian uh, cultures and all the the Pacific Rim and then the exciting thing that's happening in, in Europe for the first time in history that 11 countries are coming together to form a European coalition that it puts the child of the planet, which is like America or the United States, uh, which is so based on a hero myth or a heroine myth and fierce independence that for the, the call in the next 50 years is for Americans to learn about community, which indigenous societies and the grandparents of the planet, the old Asian cultures, and now the parents of the planet really modeling um, teamwork and collaboration and community is that America is going to need to to really learn about collaboration and community and cooperation and in order to do that then there's going to need to be the going back to what would be the archaic revival or that uh, beginning to shift so that there can be a new world order where that fourth world is addressed. Well, don't you think sort of what's happening is that people have a very strong local sense of place, yeah. loyalty, That's true. and then they are forming a planetary loyalty, yeah. but in a way all the levels in between are dissolving, so yeah. people don't think of themselves as Americans, they think of themselves as Northern Californians and Earthlings, yeah. sort of yeah. like that. Yeah. But in a way, Federal Europe which is no longer a sure thing, you know, because yes, of I these know. De know. recent developments, it goes against that. Mm -hmm. I sort of think maybe McLuhan was right, and that there is going to be a kind of electronic feudalization mm -hmm. where thought many more small states yeah. will emerge, and there is the reason detra for the nation state appears to be slowly disappearing. Yeah. And the states, I think the crisis that came to Marxism is coming now for yeah. the republicrat oligarchy uh, in yeah. America. Yeah. yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. I think there's a terrific um, shift of power that's going on uh, that out of uh, maybe the hierarchical types of power to people power, and I see two major forces contributing to that, which is is one, uh, the computer or the electronic, because it's it's people, people-based, individual-based, 
bringing the power back to the individual and also free enterprise uh, uh, rather than capitalism or communism there's that middle road coming in um, so I think that when we take a look cross-culturally at the three kinds of power or the, the power of presence or the power of communication or the power of position the willingness to take a stand is that it's going to be very important to see how those shifts of power really are going back to empowerment of the people so what are you looking toward in the future personally and globally I've been doing a, a lot with taking a look at um, what's found that's similar in all art globally because I feel that um, what humanity consistently creates in art is really re reinforcing deep um, spiritual processes and so what I've found is that there are five shapes that are found consistently in all art globally and one is the circle and the other is the cross the like the plus sign the equidistant mm -hmm. cross and the triangle and the square and the spiral and um, that the and you can see it see them all here in Prague everywhere you look I mean in all the decor are, are those shapes repeated over and over and over again so I begin to, to look cross-culturally to see if if cultures attributed the same meaning to those shapes mm -hmm. and found that 92% uh, of all the cultures attribute the same meaning to the circle which is the process of individuation or to the cross relatedness uh -huh. uh, and interconnection and interface and the square stability and foundation setting and the um, so does this imply a genetic syntax of form or something like that? I, I think that it that it's um, it's part of the archaic revival in that there would be um, a cellular, deeply cellular imprinting of some kind. Well, that's what I mean yeah, by genetic. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I really do. Or the, the triangle being the visionary or searching, seeking, questing process or the planning, dreaming process and, and the spiral being the need for variety or the need for change or growth and evolution. So it's been really wonderful. It's part of a new book that's coming out called Signs of Life. Uh, and showing how those images come up in all of the continents and are also found in literature and poetry and put all that together in one place. So do you spend much time thinking, thinking about the future? I do. I what, do. What, what's your take on it? I think that... Um, it's exciting for me to think that it, we're being called in the next 50 years to our own creative fire, that um, we all have salvation myths and we all have doomsday myths, but there's, there's a whole body of myths in mythology that have been totally overlooked that I think we're being called to, which are creation myths. And what are the creation myths but stories about how to build new worlds internally and externally. And I think that for 2,000 years we've done the polarity dance. And we're moving into a both-and world rather than an either-or world. And um, I'm excited about the, the future that if we can really move into... Um, the wisdom of the plant kingdom and if we can move into uh, the deep wisdom of, of nature as a mirror of our own nature that um, and remember our creative fire I think it will be a wonderful time in history I'm so glad I was born at the time I was born to be a part of this evolutionary re renaissance how do you see it happening I mean do you see uh a breakthrough with technology or an abandonment of technology? Do you see pharmacological engineering? Do you see new religions? Do you see... In other words, it's easy to hope, but very hard to get the details in yeah. focus. Yeah, well, I think that um, what I see is that there'll be uh, 
both the bridging of the natural and the technological. Uh, so a, a, a more cellular technology, a yes. more organic yeah, infrastructure. For sure. And I think that computers mm -hmm. are here to teach us about those organic structures. I, I think, think that that we're so. learning different kinds of systems to really see what are the the inherent systems within in nature and within our own nature. So to the degree that we can mirror nature, we can re-spiritualize, re-humanize mm -hmm. yeah. technology and interpersonal relations. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, I've come right down the line on that. Yeah. I mean, that sounds, yeah. And to me, psychedelics are just simply the best catalyst, but anything which works yeah. should be pushed to, to the that. limit. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, I don't know, I was um, just thinking that somehow we've, we've got to think about possibilities. I was thinking about in the Rosicrucian uh, era, which is very close here to Prague, is is that they would often say you can count the seeds in an apple but you can't count the apples in a seed and i think we're moving in that 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 era where we really That's good you know think of the possibilities and the seeds that we have been planting or the fact that computers are teaching us about instant feedback or instant uh, response and acknowledgement uh, and that the power of acknowledgement and feedback to allow organisms to grow. And that's why children are, in many ways, know that instinctively, that they're mesmerized by, that they can get a yes or no or go back or mm -hmm. fatal error or whatever it might be. Well, it's a kind of explicit hardwiring of our own unconscious. Yeah. No more do we create cultural artifacts that are simply our furniture, but now it, our thoughts, yes. our values are yeah. embodied yeah. in this stuff. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, very, it's very exciting. Yeah, it's it really very exciting. is. Yeah. I, my, I envision a future world where people are nomadic, aboriginal, yeah. physically perfect, to living basically naked but if you were inside one of these people's minds you would see that when they close their eyes there are menus hanging in space <laughs> that the culture is has been shrunk down to something rather like a contact lens yeah. which is in the forefront ah. of their eyelid ah. and they look into culture by closing their eyes and when they open their eyes nature in her radiance yeah. is all around yeah. Yeah. absolutely well yeah. it's great talking to you